Chapter 17 The being finished speaking and fixed his looks upon me in expectation of a reply. But I was bewildered, perplexed, and unable to arrange my ideas sufficiently to understand the full extent of his proposition. He continued, You must create a female for me, with whom I can live in the interchange of those sympathies necessary for my being. This you alone can do, and I demand it of you as a right which you must not refuse to concede. The latter part of his tale had kindled anew in me the anger that had died away while he narrated his peaceful life among the cottagers, and, as he said this, I could no longer surpass the rage that burned within me. I do not refuse it, I replied, and no torture shall ever extort a consent from me. You may render me the most miserable of men, but you shall never t make me base in my own eyes. Shall I create another like yourself, whose joint wickedness might desolate the world? Be gone. I have answered you. You may torture me, but I will never consent. You are in the wrong, replied the fiend. And instead of threatening, I am content to reason with you. I am malicious because I am miserable. And I not shun, and not am I not shunned and hated by all mankind? You, my creator, would tear me to pieces in triumph. Remember that, and tell me why I should pity man more than he pities me. You would not call it murder if you could per precipitate me into one of those ice rifts and destroy my frame, the work of your own hands. Shall I respect man when he contemns me? Let him live with me in the interchange of kindness, and instead of injury I would bestow every benefit upon him with tears of gratitude at his acceptance. But that cannot be. The human senses are insurmountable barriers to our union, yet mine shall not be the submission of abject slavery. I will revenge my injuries if I cannot inspire love. I will cause fear and chiefly towards you, my arch enemy, because my creator, do I swear an extinguishable hatred. Have a care. I will work at your destruction, nor finish until I desolate your heart, so that you shall curse the hour of your birth." A fiendish rage animated him as he said this. His face was wrinkled into contortions, too horrible for human eyes to behold. But presently he calmed himself and proceeded. I intended to reason. This passion is detrimental to me, for you do not reflect that you are the cause of its excess. If any being felt emotions of benevolence towards me, I should return them as hundred and a hundredfold. For that one creature's sake, I would make peace with the whole kind. But I now indulge in dreams of bliss that cannot be realized. What I ask of you is reasonable and moderate. I demand a creature of another sex, but as hideous as myself. The gratification is small, but it is all that I can receive, and it shall content me. It is true we shall be monsters cut off from all the world, but on that account we'll sh we shall be more attached to one another. Our lives will not be happy, but they will be harmless and free from the misery I now feel. Oh, my creator, make me happy. Let me feel gratitude towards you for one benefit. Let me see that I excite the sympathy of some existing thing. Do not deny me my request. I was moved. I shuddered when I thought of the possible consequences of my consent, but I felt that there was some justice in his argument. His tale, and the feelings he, uh, he now expressed, proved him to be a creature of fine sensations, and did I not as his maker owe him all the portion of happiness that it was in my power to bestow? He saw my change of feeling, and continued. If you consent, neither you nor any other human being shall ever see us again. I will go to the vast wilds of South America. My food is not that of man. I do not destroy the lamb and the kid to glut my appetite. Acorns and berries afford me sufficient nourishment. My companion will be of the same nature as myself and will be content with the same fare. We shall make our bed of dried leaves. The sun will shine on us as on man and will ripen our food. The picture I present to you is peaceful and human, and you must feel that you could deny it only in the wantonness of power and cruelty. Pitiless as you have been towards me, I now see compassion in your eyes. 
Let me seize the favorable moment and persuade you to promise what I do so ardently desire. You propose, replied I, to fly from the habitations of man, to dwell in those wilds where the beasts of the field will be your only companions. How can you, who long for the love and sympathy of man, persevere in this exile? You will return and again seek their kindness, and you will meet with their detestation. Your evil passions will be renewed, and you will then have a companion to aid you in the task of destruction. This may not be. Cease to argue the point, for I cannot consent. How inconstant are your feelings! But a moment ago you were moved by my representations, and why do you again harden yourself to my complaints? I swear to you by the earth which I inhabit, and by you that made me, that with the companion you bestow, I will quit the neighborhood of man, and dwell as it may be may chance in the most savage of places. My evil passions will have fled, for I shall meet with sympathy. My life will flow quietly away, and in my dying moments I shall not curse my maker." His words had a strange effect upon me. I compassioned him and sometimes felt a wish to console him. But when I looked upon him, when I saw the filthy mass that moved and talked, my heart sickened, and my feelings were altered to those of horror and hatred. I tried to stifle these sensations. I thought that as I could not sympathize with him, I had no right to withhold from him the small portion of happiness which was yet in my power to bestow. You swear, I said, to be harmless, but have you not already shown a degree of malice that should reasonably make me distrust you? May not even this be a feint that will increase your triumph by affording, affording a wider scro scope for your revenge. How is this? I must not be trifled with, and I demand an answer. If I have no ties and no affections, hatred and vice must be my portion. The love of another will destroy the cause of my crimes, and I shall become a thing of whose existence everyone will be ignorant. My vices are the children of a forced solitude that I abhor, and my virtues will necessarily arise when I live in communion with an equal. I shall feel the affections of a sensitive being and become linked to the chain of existence and events from which I am now excluded. I paused some time to reflect on all he had related and the various arguments which he had employed. I thought of the promise of virtues which he had displayed on the opening of his existence and the subsequent blight of all kindly feeling by the loathing and scorn which his protectors had manifested towards him. His power and threats were not omitted in my calculations. A creature who could exist in the ice caves of the glaciers and hide himself from the pursuit among the ridges of inaccessible precipices was being possessing faculties it would be vain to cope with. After a long pause of reflection, I concluded that the justice due both to him and my fellow creatures demanded of me that I should comply with his request. Turning to him, therefore, I said, I consent to your demand on your solemn oath to quit Europe forever and every other place in the neighborhood of man as soon as I shall deliver into your hands a female who will accompany you in your exile. I swear, he cried, by the sun and by the blue sky of heaven and by the fire of love that burns in my heart that if you grant my prayer while they exist you shall never behold me again depart to your home and commence your labors i shall watch their progress with unutterable anxiety and fear not but that when you are ready i shall appear saying this he suddenly quitted me fearful perhaps of any change in my sentiments I saw him descend the mountain with greater speed than the flight of an eagle, and quickly lost among the undulations of the sea of ice. His tail had occupied the whole day, and the sun was upon the verge of the horizon when he departed. I knew that I ought to hasten my descent towards the valley, as I should soon be encompassed in darkness, but my heart was heavy and my steps slow. The labor of winding among the little paths of the mountains, and fixing my feet firmly as I advanced, perplexed me. Occupied as I was by the emotions which the occurrences of the day had produced, night was far advanced when I came to the halfway resting place and seated myself beside the fountain. 
The stars shone at intervals as the clouds passed from over them. The dark pines rose before me, and every here and there a broken tree lay on the ground. It was a scene of wonderful solemnity, and stirred strange thoughts within me. I wept bitterly, and clasping my hands in agony, I explained, O oh, stars and clouds and winds, ye are all about to mock me. If ye really pity me, crush sensation and memory, let me become as not. But if not, depart, depart and leave me in darkness. These were wild and miserable thoughts, but I cannot describe to you how the eternal twinkling of the stars weighed upon me, and how I listened to every blast of wind as if it were a dull, ugly Sirach on its way to consume me. Morning dawned before I arrived at the village of Chomoni. I took no rest, but returned immediately to Geneva. Even in my own heart, I could give no expression to my sensations. They weighed on me um, with the mountain's weight, and their excess destroyed my agony, agony beneath them. Thus I returned home, and entering in the house, presented myself to the family. My haggard and wild appearance awoke intense alarm, but I answered no question, scarcely did I speak. I felt as if I were placed under a ban, as if I had no right to claim their sympathies as if never more might I enjoy companionship with them. Yet even thus, I loved them to adoration, and to save them, I resolved to dedicate myself to my most abhorred task. The prospect of such an occupation made every other circumstance of existence pass before me like a dream, and that thought only had to me the reality of life. Chapter 18 Day after day, week after week, passed away on my return to Geneva, and I could not collect the courage to recommence my work. I feared the vengeance of the disappointed fiend, yet I was unable to overcome my repugnance to the task which was enjoined me. I found that I could not compose a female without again devoting several months to profound study and laborious distinguish disquisition. I had heard of some discoveries having been made by an English philosopher, the knowledge of which was material to my success, and I sometimes thought of obtaining my father's consent to visit England for this purpose. But I clung to every pretense of delay, and shrunk from taking the first step in an undertaking whose immediate necessity began to appear less absolute to me. A change indeed had taken place in me. My health, which had hitherto declined, was now much restored, and my spirits, when unchecked by the memory of my unhappy prom promise, rose proportionably. My father saw this change with pleasure, and he turned his thoughts towards the best method of eradicating the remains of my melancholy, which every now and then would return by, my, by fits, and with a devouring blackness overcast the approaching sunshine. At these moments I took refuge in the most perfect solitude, I passed whole days on the lake alone in a little boat watching the clouds and listening to the rippling of the waves, silent and listless. But the fresh air and bright sun seldom failed to restore me to some degree of composure, and on my return I met the salutations of my friends with a readier smile and a more cheerful heart. It was after my return from one of these rambles that my father, calling me aside, thus addressed me. I am happy to remark, my dear son, that you have resumed your former pleasures and seem to be returning to yourself, and yet you are still unhappy and still avoid our society. For some time I was lost in conjecture as to the cause of this, but yesterday an idea struck me, and if it is well founded I conjure you to avow it. Reserve on such a point would be not only useless, but draw down treble misery on us all. I trembled violently at his exordium, and my father continued. I confess, my son, that I have always looked forward to your marriage with our dear Elizabeth as the tie of our domestic comfort, and the stay of my declining years. You were attached to each other from your earliest infancy. You studied together and appeared in dispositions and tastes entirely suited to one another. But so blind is the experience of man that what I conceive to be the best assistance to my plan may have entirely destroyed it. You perhaps regard her as your sister, 
without any wish that she might become your wife? Nay, you may have met with another whom you may love, and considering yourself as bound in honor to Elizabeth, this struggle may occasion the poignant misery which you appear to feel. My dear father, reassure yourself. I love my cousin tenderly and sincerely. I never saw any woman who excited, as Elizabeth does, my warmest admiration and affection. My future hopes and process, prospects are entirely bound up in the expectation of our union. The expression of your sentiments on this subject, my dear Victor, gives me more pleasure than I have for some time experienced. If you feel thus, we shall assuredly be happy, however present events may cast a gloom over us. But it is, it is this gloom which appears to have taken so strong a hold on your mind that I wish to dissipate it. Tell me, therefore, whether you object to an immediate solemnization of the marriage. We have been unfortunate, and recent events have drawn us from that everyday tranquility befitting my years and infirmities. You are younger, yet I do not suppose, possessed as you are of a competent fortune, that an early marriage would at all interfere with any future plans of honor and utility that you may ha have formed. Do not suppose, however, that I wish to dictate happiness to you, or that a delay on your part would cause me any serious uneasiness. Interpret my words with candor and answer me. I conjure you with confidence and sincerity. I listened to my father in silence and remained for some time incapable of offering any reply. I revolved rapidly in my mind a multitude of thoughts and endeavored to arrive at some conclusion. Alas, to me the idea of an immediate union with my Elizabeth was one of horror and dismay. I was bound by a solemn promise, which I had not yet fulfilled, and dared not break. Or, if I did, what manifold miser miseries might not impend over me and my devoted family? Could I enter into a festival with this deadly weight yet hanging round my neck, and bowing me to the ground? I must perform my engagement, and let the monster depart with his mate." before I allowed myself to enjoy the delight of a, of a union from which I expected peace. I remembered also the necessity imposed upon me of either journeying to England or entering into a long correspondence with those philosophers of that country, whose knowledge and discoveries were of indispensable use to me in my present undertaking. The latter method of obtaining the desired intelligence was dilatory and unsatisfactory. Besides, I had an insurmountable aversion to the idea of engaging myself in my loathsome task in my father's house, while it inha inhabits a familiar intercourse with those I loved. I knew that a thousand fearful accidents might occur, the slightest of which could disclose a tale to thrill all connected with me with horror. I was aware also that I should often lose all self-command, all capacity of hiding the harrowing sensations that would possess me during the progress of my unearthly occupation. I must absent myself from all I loved while thus employed. Once commenced, it would quickly be achieved, and I might be restored on my family in peace and happiness. My promise fulfilled, the monster would depart forever, or, so my fond fancy imagined, some accident might meaning, meanwhile occur to destroy him and put an end to my slavery forever. These feelings dictated my answer to my father. I expressed a wish to visit England, but concealing the true reasons of this request, I clothed my desires under a guise which excited no suspicion, while I urged my desire with an earnestness that easily induced my father to comply. After so long a period of an absorbing melancholy that resembled madness in its intensity and effects, he was glad to find that I was capable of taking pleasure in the idea of such a journey, and he hoped that change of scene and varied amusement would, before my return, have restored me entirely to myself. The duration of my absence was left to my own choice. A few months, or at most a year, was the period contemplated. One paternal kind preca precaution he had taken to ensure my having a companion. Without previously communicating with me, he had, in concert with Elizabeth, arranged that Clairvaux should join me at Strasbourg. This interfered with the solitude I coveted for the prosecution of my, my task. Yet at the commencement of my journey, the presence of my friend could in no way be an impediment, and truly I rejoiced that thus I should be saved many hours of lonely, maddening reflection. Nay, Henry might stand between me and the instruction, intrusion of my foe. If I were alone, would he not at times force his abhorred presence on me to remind me of my task or to contemplate its progress? 
To England, therefore, I was bound, and it was understood that my union with Elizabeth should take place immediately on my return. My father's age rendered him extremely averse to delay. For myself, there was one reward. I promised myself from my detested toils, one consolation for my unparalleled sufferings. It was the prospect of that day when, enfranchised from my miserable slavery, I might claim Elizabeth and forget the past in my union with her. I now made arrangements for my journey, but one feeling haunted me which filled me with fear and agitation. During my absence, I should leave my friends unconscious of the existence of their enemy and unprotected from his attacks, exasperated as he might be by my departure. But he had promised to follow me wherever I might go, and would be not and would he not accompany me to England? This imagination was dreadful in itself, but soothing, inasmuch as it supposed the safety of my friends. I was agonized of, with the idea of the possibility that the reverse of this might happen. But through the whole period during which I was the slave of my creature, I allowed myself to be governed by the impulses of the moment, and my present sensations strongly in intimated that the fiend would follow me and exempt my family from the danger of his machinations. It was in the latter end of September that I again quitted my native country. My journey had been my own suggestion, and Elizabeth therefore acquiesced, but she was filled with disquiet at the idea of my suffering away from her, the inroads of misery and grief. It had been her care which provided me a companion in Clerval, and yet a man is blind to a thousand minute circumstances which call forth a woman's sedulous attention. She longed to bid me hasten my return. A thousand conflicting emotions rendered her mute as she bade me a tearful, silent farewell. I threw myself into the carriage that was to convey me away, hardly knowing whither I was going and careless of what was passing around. I remembered only, and it was with a bitter anguish that I reflected on it, to order that my chemical instruments should be packed to go with me. Filled with dreary imaginations, I passed through many beautiful and majestic scenes, but my eyes were fixed and unobserving. I could only think of the bourne of, the, of my travels, and the work which was to occupy me whilst they endured. After some days spent in listless indolence, during which I traversed many leagues, I arrived at Strasbourg, where I waited two days for Clerval. He came. Alas, how great was the contrast between us. He was alive to every new scene, joyful when he saw the beauties of the setting sun, and more happy when he beheld it rise and recommence a new day. He pointed out to me the shifting colors of the landscape and the appearances of the sky. This is what it is to live, he cried. Now I enjoy existence, but you, my dear Frankenstein, there, wherefore are you desponding and sorrowful? In truth, I was occupied by gloomy thoughts, and neither saw the des des descent of the evening star nor the golden sunrise reflected in the Rhine. And you, my friend, would be far more amused with the journal of Clerval, who observed the scenery with an eye of feeling and delight than in listening to my reflections. I, a miserable wretch, haunted by a curse that shut up every avenue to enjoyment. We had agreed to descend the Rhine in a boat from Strasbourg to Rotterdam, whence we might take shipping from, for London. During this voyage, we passed many willowy islands and saw several beautiful towns. We stayed a day at Mannheim, and on the 5th from our departure from Strasbourg arrived at Mayence. The course of the Rhine below Mayence becomes much more picturesque. The river descends rapidly and wind winds between hills, not high, but steep and of beautiful forms. We saw many ruined castles standing on the edges of precipices, surrounded by black woods, high and inaccessible. This part of the Rhine, indeed, presents a singularly variegated landscape. In one spot you view rugged hills, ruined castles overlooking tremendous precipices, with the dark Rhine rushing beneath and on the sudden turn of a promontory flourishing vineyards with green sloping banks and a meandering river and populous towns occupy the scene we travelled at the time of the vintage and heard the song of the labourers as we glided down the stream even i depressed in mind and my spirits continually agitated by gloomy feelings even i was pleased I lay at the bottom of the boat, and as I gazed on the cloudless blue sky, I seemed to drink in a tranquility to which I had long been a stranger. And if these were my sensations, who can describe those of Henry? He felt as if he had been transported to fairyland, and enjoyed a happiness seldom tested to man. 
I have seen, he said, the most beautiful scenes of my own country. I have visited the lakes of Lucerne and Uri, where the snowy mountains descend almost perpendicularly to the water, casting black and impenetrable shades, which would cause a gloomy and mournful appearance. Were it not for the most verdant islands that relieve the eye by their gay appearance, I have seen this lake agitated by a tempest, when the wind tore up whirlwinds of water, and gave you an idea of what the water sprout must be on the great ocean. And the waves dashed with fury the base of the mountain, where the priest and his mistress were overwhelmed by an avalanche, and where their dying voices are still said to be heard amid the pauses of the nightly wind. I have seen the mountains of La Vallée and the Pays de Vaud, but this country, Victor, pleases me more than all those wonders. The mountains of Switzerland are more majestic and strange, but there is a charm in the banks of the Divine River that I never before saw equaled. Look at that castle which overhangs yon precipice. and that also on the island, almost conceal, concealed amongst the foliage of those lovely trees. And now that group of laborers coming from among their vines, and that village half hid in the recess of the mountain. Oh, surely the spirit that inhabits and guards this place has a soul more in harmony with man than those who pile the glacier or retire to the inaccessible peaks of the mountains of our own country. Clairval, Beloved friend, even now it delights me to record your words, and to dwell on the praise of which you are so eminently deserving. He was a being formed in the very poetry of nature. His wild and enthusiastic imagination was chastened by the sensibility of his heart. His soul overflowed with ardent affections, and his friendship was of that devoted and wondrous nature that the world, worldly-minded teach us to look for only in the imagination. But even human sympathies were not sufficient to satisfy his eager mind. The scenery of eternal nature, which others regard only with admiration, he loved with ardor. The sounding cataract haunted him like a passion the tall rock. The mountain and the deep and gloomy wood, their colors and their forms were then to him. An appetite, a feeling, and a love that had no need of a remoter charm by thought supplied or any interest, unburrowed from his eye. And where does he exist now exist? Is this gentle and lovely being lost forever? Has his mind so replete with ideas, imaginations fanciful and magnificent, which formed a world whose existence depended on the life of its creature? Has his mind perished? Does it now only exist in my memory? No, it is not thus. Your form, so divinely wrought and beaming with beauty, has decayed, but your spirit still visits and consoles your unhappy friend. Pardon me this gush of sorrow. These ineffectual words are but a slight tribute to the unexampled worth of Henry, but they soothe my heart overflowing with the anguish which his remembrance creates. I will proceed with my tale. Beyond Cologne, we descended to the plains of Holland, and we resolved to post the remainder of our way. For the wind was contrary, and the stream of the river was too gentle to aid us. Our journey here lost the interest arising from the beautiful scenery, but we arrived in a few days at Rotterdam, whence we proceeded by sea to England. It was on a clear morning in the latter days of December that I first saw the white cliffs of Britain. The banks of the Thames presented a new scene. They were flat but fertile, and almost every town was marked by the remembrance of some story. We saw Tilbury Fort, and remembered the Spanish Armada, Gravensend, Woolwick, and Greenwich, places which I had heard of ev even in my country. At length we saw the numerous steeples of London, St. Paul's towering above all, and the tower famed in English history. Chapter 19. London was our present point of rest. We determined to remain several months in this wonderful and celebrated city. Clerval desired the intercourse of the men of genius and talent who flourished at this time, but this was with me a secondary object. I was principally occupied with the means of obtaining the information necessary for the completion of my promise and quickly availed myself of the letters of introduction that I had brought with me, addressed to the most distinguished natural philosophers. 
If this journey had taken place during my days of study and happiness, it would have afforded me inexpressible pleasure. But a blight had come over my existence, and I only visited these people for the sake of the information that might give me on the subject in which my interest was so terribly profound. Company was irksome to me. When alone, I could fill my mind with the sights of heaven and earth. The voice of Henry soothed me, and I could thus cheat myself into a transitory peace. But busy, uninteresting, joyous faces brought back despair to my heart. I saw an insurmountable barrier placed between me and my fellow men. This barrier was sealed with the blood of William and Justine, and to reflect on the events connected with those names filled my soul with anguish. But in Clerval I saw the image of my former self. He was inquisitive and anxious to gain experience and instruction. The difference of manners which he observed was to him an inexhaustible source of instruction and amusement. He was also pursuing an object he had long had in his view. His design was to visit India in the belief that he had in his knowledge of its various languages and in the views he had taken of its society, the means of materially assisting the progress of European colonization and trade. In Britain, only could he further the execution of his plan. He was forever busy, and the only check to his enjoyments was my sorrowful and dejected mind. I tried to conceal this as much as possible, that I might not debar him from the pleasures natural to one, who was entering on a new scene of life, undisturbed by any care or bitter recollection. I often refused to accompany him, alleging another engagement that I might remain alone. I now also began to collect the materials necessary for my new creation, and this was to me like the torture of single drops of water continually falling on the head. Every thought that was devoted to it was an extreme anguish, and every word that I spoke in allusion to it caused my lips to quiver and my heart to palpitate. After passing some months in London, we received a letter from a person in Scotland, who had formerly been our visitor in Geneva. He mentioned the beauties of his native country and asked us if those were not sufficient allurements to induce us to prolong our journey as far north as Perth, where he resided. Clerval eagerly decided to ex desired to accept his invitation, and I, although I abhorred society, wished to view again mountains and streams and all the wondrous works with which nature adorns her chosen dwelling places. We had arrived in England at the beginning of October, and it was now February. We accordingly determined to commence our journey towards the north at the expiration of another month. In this expedition, we did not intend to follow the great road to Edinburgh, but to visit Windsor, Oxford, Matlock, and the Cumberland Lakes, resolving to arrive at the completion of this tour about the end of July. I packed up my chemical instruments and the materials I had collected, resolving to finish my labors in some obscure nook in the northern highlands of Scotland. We quitted London on the 27th of March and remained a few days at Windsor, rambling in its beautiful forest. This was a new scene to us mountaineers. The majestic oaks, the quantity of game, and the herds of stately deer were all novelties to us. From thence we proceeded to Oxford. As we entered this city, our minds were filled with the remembrance of the events that had been transacted there more than a century and a half before. It was here that Charles I had collected his forces. The city had remained faithful to him after the whole nation had forsake, forsaken his cause to join the standard of Parliament and liberty. <coughs> the memory of that unfortunate king and his companions, the amiable Falkland, the insolent Goring, his queen and son, gave a peculiar interest to every part of the city, which they might have might be supposed to have inhabited. The spirit of elder days found a dwelling here, and we delighted to trace its footsteps. If these feelings had not found an imaginary gratification, the appearance of the city had yet in itself sufficient beauty to obtain our admiration. The colleges are ancient and picturesque, the streets are almost magnificent, and the lovely Isis, which flows beside it through meadows of exquisite verdure, is spread forth into a placid expanse of waters, which reflects its majestic assemblage of towers and spires and domes embosomed among aged trees. I enjoyed this scene, and yet my enjoyment was embittered both by the memory of the past and the anticipation of the future. I was formed for peaceful happiness, during my youthful days, discontent never visited my mind, and if I was ever overcome by ennui, the sight of what is beautiful in nature, or the study of what is excellent and sublime in the productions of man, could always interest my heart and communicate elasticity to my spirits. 
but I am a blasted tree. The bolt has entered my soul, and I felt then that I should survive to exhibit what I shall soon cease to be, a miserable spectacle of wreck wrecked humanity, pitiable to others and intolerable to myself. We passed a considerable period at Oxford, rambling among its environs and endeavoring to identify every spot with which re relate to the most animating epoch of English history. Our little voyages of discovery were often prolonged by the successive objects that presented themselves. We visited the tomb of the illustrious Hamden and the field on which the Patriot fell. For a moment my soul was elevated from its debasing and miserable fears to contemplate the divine ideas of liberty and self-sacrifice, of which these sites were the monuments and the remembrances. For an instant I dared to shake off my chains and look around me with a free and lofty spirit, but the iron had eaten into my flesh, and I sank again, trembling and hopeless, into my miserable self. We left Oxford with regret and proceeded to Matlock, which was our next place to re of rest. The country in the neighborhood of our village resembled, to a greater degree, the scenery of Switzerland. But everything is on a lower scale, and the green hills want the crown of distant white alps, which always attend on the piney mountains of my native country. We visited the wondrous cave and the little cabinets of natural history, where the curiosities are disposed in this manner, as in the collections of Servaux and Chaumony. The latter name made me tremble when pronounced by Henry, and I hastened to quit Matlock, with which the t that terrible scene was thus associated. From Derby, still journeying northward, we passed two months in Cumberland and Westermoreland. I could now almost fancy myself among the Swiss mountains, the little patches of snow which yet lingered on the northern sides of the mountains, the lakes, and the dashing of the rock streams were all familiar and dear sights to me. Here also we made some acquaintances who almost contrived to cheat me into happiness. The delight of Clerval was proportionably greater than mine. His mind expanded in the company of men of talent, and he found in his own nature greater capacities and resources than he could have imagined himself to have possessed while he associated with his inferiors. I could pass my life here, said he to me, and among these mountains I should scarcely regret Switzerland and the Rhine. But he found that a traveler's life is one that includes much pain amidst its enjoyments. His feelings are forever on the stretch, and when he begins to sink into repose, he finds himself obliged to quit that on which he rests in pleasure for something new, which again engages his intention, and which also he forsakes for other novelties. We had scarcely visited the various lakes of Cumberland and Westermoreland, and conceived an affection for some of the inhabitants, when the period of our appointment with our Scotch friend approached, and we left them to travel on. For my own part I was not sorry. I had now neglected my promise for some time, and I feared the effects of the demon's disappointment. He might remain in Sw Switzerland and wreak his vengeance on my relatives. This idea pursued me, and tormented me at every moment from which I might otherwise have snatched repose and peace. I waited for my letters with feverish impatience. If they were delayed, I was miserable and overcome by a thousand fears, and when they arrived and I saw the super superscription of Elizabeth or my father, I hardly dared to read and ascertain my fate. Sometimes I thought that the fiend followed me and might expedite my remiss remissness by murdering my companion. When these thoughts possessed me, I would not quit Henry for a moment, but followed him as his shadow to protect him from the fancied rage of his destroyer. I felt as if I had committed some great crime, the consciousness of which haunted me. I was guiltless, but I had indeed drawn down a horrible curse upon my head, as mortal as that of crime. I visited Edinburgh with languid eyes and mind, and yet the city might have interested the most unfortunate being. Clerval did not like it so well as Oxford, for the antiquity of the latter city was more pleasing to him. But the beauty and regularity of the new town of Edinburgh it, its romantic castle and its environs, environs, the most delightful in the world, Arthur's Seat, St. Bernard's Well, and the Pentland Hills compensated him for the change and filled him with cheerfulness and admiration. But I was impatient to arrive at the termination of my journey. We left Edinburgh in a week, passing through Coupier, St. Andrews, and along the banks of the Tay to Perth, where our friend expected us.
but I was in no mood to laugh and talk with strangers, or enter into their feelings or plans with the good humor expected from a guest, and accordingly I told Clerval that I wished to make the tour of Scotland alone. Do you, said I, enjoy yourself and let this be our rendezvous. I may be absent a month or two, but do not interfere with my motions. I entreat you. Leave me to peace and solitude for a short time, and when I return, I hope it will be with a lighter heart, more congenial to your own temper. Henry wished to dissuade me, but seeing me bent on this plan ceased to remonstrate. He entreated me to write often. I had rather be with you, he said, in your solitary rambles than with these Scotch people, whom I do not know. Hasten then, my dear friend, to return, that I may again feel myself somewhat at home, which I cannot do in your absence. Having parted from my friend, I determined to visit some remote spot of Scotland and finish my work in solitude. I did not doubt but that the monster followed me and would discover himself to me when I should have finished that he might receive his companion. With this resolution, I traversed the northern highlands and fixed on one of the remotest of the Orkneys as the scene of my labors. It was a place fitted for such a work, being hardly more than a rock, whose high sides were continually beaten upon by the waves. The soil was barren, scarcely affording pasture for a few miserable cows and oatmeal for its inhabitants, which consisted of five persons whose gaunt and scraggy limbs gave tokens of their miserable fare. Vegetables and bread, when they indulged in such luxuries, and even fresh water, was to be procured from the mainland, which is about five miles distant. On the whole island there were but three miserable huts, and one of these was vacant when I arrived. This I hired. It contained but two rooms, and these exhibited all the squalidness of, my most, of the most miserable penury. The thatch had fallen in, the walls were unplastered, and the door was off its hinges. I ordered it to be repaired, bought some furniture, and took possession, an incident which would, doubtless, have occasioned some surprise, had not all the senses of the cottagers had been benumbed by want and squalid poverty. As it was, I lived, ungazed at the unmo and unmolested, hardly thanked by for the pittance of food and clothes which I gave. So much does suffering blunt even the coarsest sensations of men. In this retreat I devoted the morning to labor, but in the evening, when the weather permitted, I walked on the stony beach of the sea to listen to the waves as they roared and dashed at my feet. It was a monotonous yet ever-changing scene. I thought of Switzerland. It was far different from this desolate and appalling landscape. Its hills are covered with vines, and its cottages are scattered thickly in the plains. Its fair lakes reflect a blue and gentle sky, and when troubled by the winds, their tumult is but as the play of a lively infant when compared to the roarings of the giant ocean. In this manner I distributed my occupations when I first arrived, but as I proceeded in my labor it became every day more horrible and irksome to me. Sometimes I could not prevail on myself to enter my laboratory for several days, and at other times I toiled day and night in order to complete my work. It was indeed a filthy process in which I was engaged. During my first experiment, a kind of enthusiastic frenzy blinded me to the horror of my employment. My mind was intently fixed on the consummation of my labor, and my eyes were shut to the horror of my proceedings. But now I went to it in a cold blood, and my heart often sickened at the work of my hands. Thus situated, employed in the most detestable occupation, immersed in a solitude where nothing could for an instant call my attention from the actual scene in which I was engaged, my spirits became unequal. I grew restless and nervous. Every moment I feared to meet my persecutor. Sometimes I sat with my eyes fixed on the ground, fearing to raise them lest they should encounter the object which I so much dreaded to behold. I feared to wander from the sight of my fellow creatures, lest when alone he would come to claim his companion. In the meantime I worked on, and my labor was already considerably advanced. I looked towards its completion with a tremulous and eager hope, which I dared not trust myself to question, but which was intermixed with obscure forebodings of evil that made my heart sicken, sicken in my bosom. Chapter 20. I sat one evening in my laboratory. The sun had set, and the moon was just rising from the sea. 
I had not sufficient light for my employment, and I remained idle. In a pause of consideration of whether I should leave my labor for the night, or hasten its conclusion by an unremitting attention to it, as I sat, a train of reflection occurred to me which led me to consider the effects of what I was now doing. Three years before I was engaged in the same manner, and had created a fiend whose unparalleled barbarity had desolated my heart and filled it forever with the, bitter, with the bitterest remorse. I was now about to form another being of whose dispositions I was alike ignorant. She might become ten thousand times more malignant than her mate, and delight for its own sake in murder and wretchedness. He had sworn to quit the neighborhood of man and hide himself in deserts, but she had not, and she, who in all probability was to become a thinking and reasoning animal, might refuse to comply with a comp compact made before her creation. They might even hate each other. The creature who already lo lived loathed his own deformity, and might he not conceive a greater abhorrence for it when it came before his eyes in the female form? She also might turn with disgust from him to the superior beauty of man. She might quit him, and he be again alone, exasperated by the fresh provocation of being deserted by one of his own species. Even if they were to leave Europe, and inhabit the deserts of the New World, yet one of the first results of those sympathies for which the demon thirsted would be children, and a race of devils would be propagated upon the earth, who might make the very existence of the species of man a condition precarious and full of terror. Had I right, for my own benefit, to inflict this curse upon everlasting generations? I had before been moved by the sophisms of the, the being I had created. I had been struck senseless by his fiendish threats, but now, for the first time, the wickedness of my promise burst upon me. I shuddered to think that future ages might curse me as their pest, whose selfishness had not hesitated to buy its own peace at the price, perhaps, of the existence of the whole of human race. I trembled, and my heart failed within me, when on looking up I saw, by the light of the moon, the demon at the casement. A ghastly grin wrinkled his lips as he gazed on me where I sat, fulfilling the task which he had allotted to me. Yes, he had followed me in my travels. He had loitered in forests, hid himself in caves, or taken refuge in wide and desert heaths, and he now came to mark my progress and claim the fulfillment of my promise. As I looked on him, his countenance expressed the utmost extent of malice and treachery. I thought with a sensation of madness on my promise of creating another like him, and, trembling with passion, tore the, to pieces the thing on which I was engaged. The wretch saw me destroy the creature on whose future existence he depended for happiness, and, with a howl of devilish despair and re revenge, withdrew. I left the room, and, locking the door, made a solemn vow in my own heart never to resume my labors, and then... With trembling steps, I sought my own apartment. I was alone. None were near me to dissipate the gloom and relieve me from the sickening oppression of the most ter terrible reveries. Several hours passed, and I remained near my window gazing on the sea. It was almost motionless, for the winds were hushed, and all nature reposed under the eye of the quiet moon. A few fishing vessels alone specked the water, and now and then the gentle breeze wafted the sound of voices as the fishermen called to one another. I felt the silence, although I was hardly conscious of its extreme profundity, profundity until my ear was suddenly arrested by the paddling of oars near the shore, and a person landed close to my house. And a few minutes after, I heard the creaking of my door as if some, someone endeavored to open it softly. I trembled from head to foot. I felt pres presentiment of who it was, and wished to rouse one of the peasants who dwelt in a cottage not far from mine. But I was overcome by the sensation of helplessness, so often felt in frightful dreams, when you in vain endeavor to fly from an impending danger and was rooted to the spot. Presently I heard the sound of footsteps along the passage. The door opened, and the wretch whom I dreaded appeared. Shutting the door, he approached me, and said, in a smothered voice, You have destroyed the work which you began. 
What is it that you intend? Do you dare to break your promise? I have endured toil and misery. I left Switzerland with you. I crept along the shores of the Rhine, among its willow islands, and over the summits of its hills. I have dwelt many months in the heaths of England, and among the deserts of Scotland. I have endured incalculable fatigue, and cold, and hunger. Do you dare destroy my hopes? Be gone. I do break my promise. Never will I create another like yourself, equal in deformity and wickedness. Slave, before I reasoned with you, but you have proved yourself unworthy of my condensation. Remember that I have power. You believe yourself miserable, but I can make you so wretched that the light of day would be hateful to you. You are my creator, but I am your master. Oh, Bay. The hour of my re irresolution is past, and the period of your power is arrived. Your threats cannot move me to do an act of wickedness, but they confirm me in a determination of not creating you a companion in vice. Shall I, in cool blood, set loose upon the earth a demon whose delight is in death and wretchedness? Be gone. I am firm, and your words will only exasperate my rage. The monster saw my determination in my face and gnashed his teeth in the impotence of anger. Shall each man find a wife for his bosom, and each beast have his mate, and I be alone? I had feelings of affection, and they were requited by detestation and scorn. Man, you may hate, but beware. Your hours will pass in dread and misery, and soon the bolt will fall, which must ravish from you your happiness forever. Are you to be happy while I grovel in the intensity of my wretchedness? You can blast my other passions, but revenge remains. Revenge, henceforth, drew dearer than light or food. I may die, but first you, my tyrant and tormentor, shall curse the sun that gazes on your misery. Beware, for I am fearless and therefore powerful. I will watch with the wildness of a snake, that I may sting with its venom. Man, you shall repent of the injuries you inflict. Devil, cease, and do not poison the air with these sounds of malice. I have declared my resolution to you, and I am no coward to bend beneath words. Leave me. I am inexorable. It is well I go, but remember, I shall be with you on your wedding night. I started forward and exclaimed, Villain, before you sign my death warrant, be sure that you are yourself safe. I would have seized him, but he eluded me and quitted the house with precipitation. In a few moments I saw him in his boat, which shot across the waters with her arrowy swiftness and was soon lost amidst the waves. All was again silent, but his words rung in my ears. I burned with rage to pursue the murderer of my peace and pre precipitate him into the ocean. I walked up and down my room hastily and perturbed, while my imagination conjured up a thousand images to torment and sting me, why I had not followed him and closed with him in mortal strife. But I had suffered him to depart, and he had directed his course towards the mainland. I shuddered to think who might be the next victim sacrificed in his insatiate revenge, and then I thought again of his words. I will be with you on your wedding night. That, then, was the period fixed for fulfillment of my destiny. In that hour I should die, and at once satisfy and extinguish his malice. The prospect did not move me to fear, yet when I thought of my beloved Elizabeth, of her tears and endless sorrow, when she should find her lover so barbarously snatched from her, tears, the first I had shed for many months, streamed from my eyes, and I resolved not to fall before my enemy without a bitter struggle. The night passed away, and the sun rose from the ocean. My feelings became calmer, if it may be called calmness, when the violence of rage sinks into the depths of despair. I left the house, 
the horrid scene of the last night's contention and walked on the beach of the sea, which I almost regarded as an insuperable barrier between me and my fellow creatures. Nay, a wish that such should prove the fact stole across me. I desired that I might pass my life on that barren rock warily, it is true, but uninterrupted by any sudden shock of misery. If I returned, it was to be sacrificed, or to see those whom I most loved die under the grasp of a demon whom I had myself created. I walked about the isle like a restless specter, separated from all it loved and miserable in the separation. When it became noon and the sun rose higher, I lay down on the grass and was overpowered by a deep sleep. I had been awake the whole of the preceding night, by my nerves were agitated, and my eyes inflamed by watching and misery. The sleep into which I now sunk refreshed me, and when I awoke, I again felt as if I belonged to a race of human beings like myself, and I began to reflect upon what had passed with greater composure. Yet still the words of the fiend rung in my ears like a death knell. They appeared like a dream, yet distinct and oppressive as a reality. The sun had far descended, and I still sat on the shore, satisfying my appetite, which had become ravenous, with an oaten cake, when I saw a fishing boat close to me, and one of the men brought me a packet. It contained letters from Geneva, and one from Clerval, entreating me to join him. He said that he was wearing away his time fruitlessly where he was, that letters from the friends he had formed in London desired his return to complete the negotiation they had entered into for his Indian enterprise. He could not any longer delay his departure, but as his journey to London might be followed, even sooner than he now conjectured. By his longer voyage, he entreated me to bestow as much of my society on him as I could spare. He besought me, therefore, to leave my solitary isle and to meet him at Perth, that we might proceed southwards together. This letter in a degree recalled me to life, and I determined to, qu to quit my island at the expiration of two days. Yet before I departed, there was a task to perform on which I shuddered to reflect. I must pack up my chemical instruments, and for the purpose I must enter the room which had been the scene of my odious work, and I must handle those utensils, the sight of which was sickening to me. The next morning at daybreak I summoned sufficient courage and unlocked the door of my laboratory. The remains of the half-finished creature whom I had destroyed lay scattered on the floor, and I almost felt as if I had mangled the living flesh of a human being. I paused to collect myself and then entered the chamber. With trembling hands I conveyed the instruments out of the room, but I reflected that I ought not leave the relics of my work to excite the horror and suspicion of the peasants, and I accordingly put them into a basket with a great quantity of stones, and laying them up determined to throw them into the sea that very night, and in the meantime I sat up the beach, employed in cleaning and arranging my chemical apparatuses. Nothing could be more complete than the alteration that had taken in my feelings since that night of the appearance of the demon. I had before regarded my promise with a gloomy despair, and as this thing, and as a thing that, with whatever consequences, must be fulfilled. But I now felt as if a film had been taken from before my eyes, and that I, for the first time, saw clearly. The idea of renewing my labors did not for one instant occur to me. The threat I had heard weighed on my thoughts, but I did not reflect that a voluntary act of mine could avert it. I had resolved in my own mind that, to create another like the fiend I had first made, would be an act of the, the basest and most atrocious selfishness, and I banished from my mind every thought that could lead to a different conclusion. Between two and three in the morning the moon rose, and I then, putting my basket aboard a little skiff, sailed about four miles from shore. The scene was perfectly solitary. A few boats were returning towards land, but I sailed away from them. I felt as if I was about to commission a dreadful crime, and avoided with shuddering anxiety any encounter with my fellow creatures. At one time the moon, which had before been clear, was suddenly overspread by a thick cloud, and I took advantage of the moment and of darkness, and cast my basket into the sea. I listened to the gurgling sound as it sunk, and then sailed away from the spot. The sky became clouded, but the air was pure, although chilled by the northeast breeze that was then rising. But it refreshed me, and filled me with such agreeable sensations that I resolved to prolong my stay on the water, and fixing the rudder in a direct position, stretched myself at the bottom of the boat. Clouds hid the mood, everything was obscure, and I heard only the sound of the boat as its keel cut through the waves. The murmur lulled me, 
and in a short time I slept soundly. I do not know how long I remained in this situation, but when I awoke I found that the sun had already mounted considerably. The wind was high and the waves continually threatened the safety of my little skiff. I found that the wind was northeast and must have driven me far from the coast from which I had embarked. I endeavored to change my course, but quickly found that if I again made the attempt, the boat would be instantly filled with water. Thus situated, my only res resource was to drive before the wind. I confess that I felt a few sensations of terror. I had no compass with me and was so slenderly acquainted with the geography of this part of the world that the sun was of little benefit to me. I might be driven into the wide Atlantic and feel all the torches of starvation or be swallowed up in immeasurable waters that roared and buffeted around me. I had already been out many hours and felt the torment of a burning thirst, a prelude to my other sufferings. I looked on the heavens, which were covered by clouds that flew before the wind, only to repla be replaced by others. I looked upon the sea. It was to be my grave. Fiend, I explained, your task is already fulfilled. I thought of Elizabeth, of my father, and Clairvel, all left behind on whom the monster might satisfy his sanguinary and merciless passions. This idea plunged me into a reverie so despairing and frightful that even now, when the scene is on the point of closing before me forever, I shuddered to reflect on it. Some hours passed thus, but by degrees, as the sun declined towards the horizon, the wind died away in the gentle breeze, and the sea became free from breakers, but these gave place to a heavy swell. I felt sick and hardly able to hold the rudder when I suddenly I saw a line of high land towards the south. Almost spent as I was by fatigue and dreadful suspense, I endured for several hours. This sudden certainty of life rushed like a flood of warm joy to my heart, and tears gushed from my eyes. How mutable are our feelings, and how strange is that clinging love which we have life, even in the excess of misery. I constructed another sail with part of my dress and eagerly steered my course towards the land. It had a wild and rocky appearance, but as I approached nearer I easily perceived the traces of cultivation. I saw vessels near the shore and found myself suddenly transported back to the neighborhood of civilized man. I carefully traced the windings of the land and hailed a steeple which I at length saw issuing from behind a small promontory. As I was in a state of extreme debility, I resolved to sail directly towards the town as a place where I could most easily procure nourishment. Fortunately, I had money with me as I turned to the promontory. I perceived a small neat town and a good harbor which I entered, my heart bounding with joy at my unexpected escape. As I was occupied in fixing the boat and arranging the sail, several people crowded towards the spot. They seemed much surprised at my appearance, but instead of offering me any assistance, whispered together with gestures that at any other time might have produced in me a slight sensation of alarm. As it was, I merely remarked that they spoke English, and I therefore addressed them in that language. My good friend, said I, will you be so kind as to tell me the name of this town and inform me where I am? You will know that soon enough, replied a man with a hoarse voice. Maybe you are come to a place that will not prove much to your taste, but you will not be consulted as to your quarters, I promise you. I was exceedingly surprised on receiving so rude an answer from a stranger, and I was also disconcerted on perceiving the frowning and angry countenances of his companions. Why do you answer me so roughly, I replied. Surely it is not the custom of Englishmen to receive strangers so inhospitably. I do not know, said the man, what the custom of the English may be, but is the custom of the Irish to hate villains. While the strange dialogue continued, I perceived the crowd rapidly increase. Their faces expressed a mixture of curiosity and anger, which annoyed in some degree alarmed me. I inquired the way to the end, but no one replied. I then moved forward, and murmuring sound arose from the crowd as they followed and surrounded me, when an ill-looking man approaching tapped me on the shoulder and said, Come, sir, you must follow me to Mr. Kieran's to give an account of yourself. Who is Mr. Kieran? Why am I to give an account of myself? Is not this a free country? Aye, sir, free enough to honest folks. Mr. Kieran is a magistrate, and you are to give an account of the death of a gentleman who was found murdered here last night. This answer startled me, but I presently recovered myself. I was innocent, that could easily be proved. Accordingly, I followed my conductor in silence and was led to one of the best houses in the town. I was ready to sink from fatigue and hunger, but being surrounded by a crowd, I thought it pr 
politic to rouse all my strength that no physical debility might be co construed into apprehension or conscious guilt. Little did I then expect the calamity that was in a few moments to overwhelm me and extinguish in horror and despair all fear of ignominy or death. I must pause here, for it requires all my fortitude to recall the memory of the frightful events which I am about to relate in proper detail to my recollection. Chapter 20 I was soon introduced into the presence of the magistrate, an old benevolent man with calm and mild manners. He looked upon me, however, with some degree of severity, and then, turning towards my conductors, he asked who appeared as witnesses on his, this occasion. About half a dozen men came forward, and one being selected by the magistrate, he deposed that he had been out fishing the night before with his son and brother-in-law, Daniel Nugent, when about ten o'clock they observed a strong northerly blast rising, and they accordingly put in for port. It was a very dark night, as the moon had not yet risen. They did not land at the harbor, but as they had been accustomed at a creek about two miles below. He walked on first, carrying a part of the fishing tackle, and his companions followed him at some distance. As he was proceeding along the sands, he struck his foot against something and fell at his length on the ground. His companions came up to assist him, and by the light of their lantern they found that he had fallen on the body of a man who was to all appearance dead. Their first supposition was that it was the corpse of some person who had been drowned and was thrown on shore by the waves, but on examination they found that the clothes were not wet, and even that the body was not then cold. They instantly carried it to the cottage of an old woman near the spot, and endeavored, but in vain, to restore it to life. It appeared to be a handsome young man, about five and twenty years of age. He had apparently been strangled, for there was no sign of any violence except the black mark of fingers on his neck. The first part of his disposition, des, disposition did not in the least interest me, but when the mark of the fingers was mentioned, I remembered the murder of my brother and felt myself extremely agitated. My limbs trembled, and a mist came over my eyes, which obliged me to lean on a chair for support. The magistrate observed me with a keen eye and, of course, drew an unfavorable augury from my manner. The son confirmed his father's account, but when Daniel Nugent was called, he swore positively that, just before the fall of his companion, he saw a boat with a single man in it, at a short distance from the shore, and as far as he could judge by the light of a few stars, it was the same boat in which I had just landed. A woman deposed that she lived near the beach and was standing at the door of her cottage, waiting for the return of the fisherman, about an hour before she heard of the discovery of the body, when she saw a boat with only one man in it, push off from the part of the shore where the corpse was afterwards found. Another woman confirmed the account of the fisherman having brought the body into her house. It was not cold. They put it into a bed and rubbed it, and Daniel went to the town for an apothecary, but life was quite gone. Several other men were examined concerning my landing, and they agreed that with the strong north wind that had risen during the night, it was very probable that I had beaten about for many hours, and had been obliged to return nearly to the same spot from which I had departed. Besides, they observed that it appeared that I had brought the body from another place, and it was likely that as I did not appear to know the shore, I might have put into the harbor ignorant of the distance of the town, of the town from the place where I had deposited the corpse. Mr. Kirwin, on hearing this evidence, desired that I should be taken into the room where the body lay for internment, that it might be observed what effect the sight of it would produce upon me. This idea was probably suggested by the extreme agitation I had exhibited when the mode of the murder had been described. I was accordingly conducted by the magistrate and several other persons to the inn. I could not help being struck by the strange coincidences that had taken place during the eventful night. But, knowing that I had been conversing with several persons in the island I had inhabited about the time that the body had been found, I was perfectly tranquil as to the consequences of the affair. I entered the room where the corpse lay, and was led up to the coffin. How can I describe my sensations on beholding it? I feel yet parched with horror, nor can I reflect on that terrible moment without shuddering in agony. The examination, the presence of the magistrate and witnesses, passed like a dream from my memory when I saw the lifeless form of Henry Clavel stretched before me. I gasped for breaths, and throwing myself on the body, I explained, Have my murderous machinations deprived you also, my dearest Henry, of life? Two I have already destroyed, 
and other victims await their destiny, but you, Clerval, my friend, my benefactor. The human frame could no longer support the agonies that I endured, and I was carried out of the room in strong convulsions. A fever succeeded to this. I lay for two months on the point of death. My ravings, as I afterwards heard, were frightful. I called myself the murderer of William and of Justine and of Clerval. Sometimes I entreated my attendants to assist me in the destruction of the fiend by whom I was tormented, and at others I felt the fingers of the monster already grasping my neck, and screamed aloud with agony and terror. Fortunately, as I spoke my native language, Mr. Kieran alone understood me, but my gestures and bitter cries were sufficient to affright the other witnesses. Why did I not die? More miserable than man ever was before, why did I not sink into forgetfulness and rest? Death snatches away many blooming children, the only hopes of their doting parents. How many brides and youthful lovers have been one day in the bloom of health and hope, and the next a prey for worms and the decay of the tomb? Of what materials was I made, that I could thus resist so many shocks, which, like the turning of the wheel, continually renewed the torture? But I was doomed to live, and in two months found myself as awakening from a dream, in a prison, stretched on a wretched bed, surrounded by gaolers, turnkeys, bolts, and all the miserable apparatus of a dungeon. It was morning. I remember when I thus awoke to understanding. I had forgotten the particulars of what had happened, and only felt as if some great misfortune had suddenly overwhelmed me. But when I looked around and saw the barred windows, and the squalidness of the room in which I was, all flashed across my memory, and I groaned bitterly. This sound disturbed an old woman who was sleeping in a chair beside me. She was a hired nurse, the wife of one of the turnkeys, and her countenance expressed all those bad qualities which often chast characterized that class. The lines of her face were hard and rude, like that of a person's accustomed to see without sympathizing in sights of misery. Her tone expressed her entire indifference. She addressed me in English, and the voice struck me as one that had been heard during my sufferings. "'Are you better now, sir?' said she. I replied in the same language with a feeble voice. I believe I am. But if it be all true, if indeed I did not dream, I am sorry that I am still alive to fill this misery and hoarder. For that matter, replied the old woman, if you mean about the gentleman you murdered, I believe that it were better for you if you were dead, for I fancy it will go hard with you. However, that's none of my business. I am sent to nurse you and get you well. I do my duty with a safe conscience. It were well if everybody did the same. I turned with loathing from the woman who could utter so unfeeling a speech to a person just saved on the very verge of the edge of death, but I felt languid and unable to reflect on all that passed. The whole series of life appeared to me as a dream. I sometimes doubted if indeed it were all true for it never presented itself to my mind with the force of reality. As the images that floated before me became more distinct, I grew feverish. A darkness pressed around me. No one was near me who soothed me with the gentle voice of love. No dear hand supported me. The physician came and prescribed medicines, and the old woman prepared them for me. But other carelessness was visible in the first, and the expression of brutality was strongly marked in the visage of the second. Who could be interested in the fate of a murderer? but the hangman who, who would gain his fee. These were my first reflections, but I soon learned that Mr. Curran was shown me extreme, had shown me extreme kindness. He had, caught, he had caused the best room in the prison to be prepared for me. Wretched indeed was the best. And it was he who would have provided a physician and a nurse. It is true he seldom came to see me, for although he ardently desired to relieve the sufferings of every human creature, he did not wish to be present at the agonies and miserable ravings of a murderer. He came, therefore, sometimes to see that I was not ne neglected, but his visits were short and with long intervals. One day, while I was gradually recovering, I was seated in a chair, my eyes half open, and my cheeks livid like those in death. I was overcome by gloom and misery, and often reflected I had better seek death than desire to remain in a world which to me was replete with wretchedness. At one time I considered whether I should not declare myself guilty and suffer the penalty of the law, less innocent than poor Justine had been. Such were my thoughts when the door of my apartment was opened and Mr. Curran entered. His countenance expressed sympathy and compassion. He drew a chair close to mine and addressed me in French. 
I fear that this place is very shocking to you. Can I do anything to make you more comfortable? I thank you, but all that you mention is nothing to me. On the whole of earth, there is no comfort which I am capable of receiving. I know that the sympathy of a stranger can be but a little relief to one born down as you are by so strange a misfortune, but you will, I hope, soon quit this melancholy abode, for doubtless evidence can easily be brought to free you from the criminal charge. That is my least concern. I am by a course of strange events become the most miserable of mortals, persecuted and tortured as I am and have been. Can death be any, any evil to me? Nothing indeed could be more unfortunate and agonizing than the strange chances that have lately occurred. You were thrown by some surprising accident on this shore, renowned for its hospitality, seized immediately and charged with murder. The first sight that was presented to your eyes was the body of your friend, murdered in so unaccountable a manner, and placed, as it were, by some fiend across your path. As Mr. Kieran said this, notwithstanding the agitation I endured on the retrospect of my sufferings, I also felt considerable surprise at the knowledge he seemed to possess concerning me. I suppose some astonishment was exhibited in my countenance, for Mr. Kieran hastened to say, Immediately upon being taken ill, all the papers that were on your person were brought me, and I examined them that I might discover some trace by which I could send to your relations an account of your misfortune and illness. I found several letters among others, one which I discovered from its commencements to be from your father. I instantly wrote to Geneva, nearly two months have elapsed since the departure of my letter. But you are ill. Even now you tremble, you are unfit for agitation of any kind." This suspense is a thousand times worse than the most horrible event. Tell me what new scene of death has been acted and whose murder I am now to lament. Your family is perfectly well, said Mr. Kieran with gentleness, and someone, a friend, has come to visit you. I know not by what chain of thought the idea presented itself, but it instantly darted into my mind that the murderer had come to mock at my misery and taunt me with the death of Clerval as a new incitement for me to comply in his hellish desires. I put my hand before my eyes and cried out in agony. Oh, take him away. I cannot see him. For God's sake, do not let him enter. Mr. Kieran regarded me with a troubled countenance. He could not help regarding my exclamation as a presumption of my guilt and said in rather a severe tone, I should have thought, young man, that the presence of your father would have been welcome instead of inspiring such violent repugnance. My father? cried I while every feature and every muscle was relaxed from anguish to pleasure. Is my father here? Come? How kind, how very kind, but where is he? Why does he not hasten to me? My change of manner surprised and pleased the magistrate. Perhaps he thought that my former exclamation was a mo momentary return of delirium, and now he instantly resumed his former benevolence. He rose and quitted the room with my nurse, and in a moment my father entered. Nothing at this moment could have given me greater pleasure than the arrival of my father. I stretched out my hand to him and cried, Are you then safe, and Elizabeth, and Ernest? My father calmed me with assurances of their welfare, and endeavored by dwelling on these subjects, so interesting to my heart to raise my desponding spirits, but he soon felt that a prison cannot be the abode of cheerfulness. What a place is this that you inhabit, my son! said he, looking mournfully at the barred windows and wretched appearance of the room. You travel to seek happiness, but a fatality seems to pursue you. And poor Clerval. The name of my unfortunate and murdered friend was an agitation too great to be endured in my weak state. I shed tears. Alas, yes, my father, replied I. Some destiny of the most horrible kind hangs over me, and I must live to fulfill it, or surely I should have died on the coffin of Henry." We were not allowed to converse for any length of time, for the precarious state of my health rendered every precaution necessary that could ensure tranquility. Mr. Kieran came in and insisted that my strength should not be exhausted by too much exertion, but the appearance of my father was to me like that of, a good, of my good angel, and I gradually recovered my health. As my sickness quitted me, I was absorbed by a gloomy and black melancholy that nothing could dissipate. The image of Clerval was forever before me, ghastly and murdered. More than once the agitation into which these reflections threw me made my friends dread a dangerous relapse. Alas, why did they persevere so miserable and detested a life? It was surely that I might fulfill my destiny which is now drawing to a close. 
Soon, oh, very soon, will death extinguish these throbbings and relieve me from the mighty weight of anguish that bears me to the dust. And in an executing the award of justice, I shall also sink to rest. Then the appearance of death was distant, although the wish was ever present to my thoughts, and I often sat for hours motionless and speechless, wishing for some mighty revolution that might bury me and destroy, and my destroyer in its ruins. The season of the Assizes approached. I had already been three months in prison, and although I was still weak and in continual danger of a relapse, I was obliged to travel nearly a hundred miles to the county town where the court was held. Mr. Curran charged himself with every care of collecting witnesses and arranging my defense. I was spared the disgrace of appearing publicly as a criminal, as the case was not brought before the court that decides on life and death. The grand jury rejected the bill on its being proved that I was on the Orkney Island, Islands at the hour of the body of my friend was found, and a fortnight after my removal I was liberated from prison. My father was enraptured on finding me freed from the vexations of a criminal charge that I was again allowed to breathe the fresh atmosphere and permitted to return to my native country. I did not participate in these feelings, for to me the walls of a dungeon or a palace were li alike hateful. The cup of life was poisoned forever, and although the sun shone upon me as upon the happy and gay of heart, I saw around me nothing but a dense and frightful darkness, penetrated by no light but the glimmer of two eyes that glared upon me. Sometimes they were the expressive eyes of Henry, languishing in death, the dark orbs nearly covered by the lids, and the long black lashes that fringed them. Sometimes it was the watery, clouded eyes of the monster, as I first saw them in my chamber at Ingolstadt. My father tried to awaken in me the feelings of affection. He talked of Geneva, which I should soon visit, of Elizabeth and Ernest, but these words only drew deep groans from me. Sometimes, indeed, I felt a wish for happiness and thought with melancholy delight of my beloved cousin, or longed with a devouring melody dupe to see once more the blue lake and rapid Rhone that had been so dear to me in early childhood. But my general state of feeling was of torpor, in which a prison was as welcome as a residence as the divinest scene of nature, and these fits were seldom interrupted but by the paroxysms of anguish and despair. At these moments I often endeavored to put an end to the existence I loathed, and it required unceasing attendance and vigilance to restrain me from committing some dreadful act of violence. Yet one duty remained to me, the recollection of which finally triumphed over my selfish despair. It was necessary that I should return without delay to Geneva, there to watch over the lives of those I so fondly loved, and to lie in wait for the murderer, that if any chance led me to the place of his concealment, or if he dared again to blast me by his presence, I might, with unfailing aim, put an end to the existence of the monstrous image which I had endued with the mockery of a soul still more monstrous." My father still desired to delay our departure, fearful that I could not sustain the fatigues of a journey, for I was so shattered a wreck, the shadow of a human being. My strength was gone. I was a mere skeleton, and fever night and day preyed upon my wasted frame. Still, as I urged our leaving Ireland with such inquietude and impatience, my father thought it best to yield. We took our passage on board a vessel bound for Havre de Grace, and sailed with a fair wind from the Irish shores. It was midnight. I lay on the deck looking at the stars and listening to the dashing of the waves. I held the darkness that shut Ireland from my sight, and my pulse beat with a feverish joy when I reflected that I should soon see Geneva. The past appeared to me in the light of a frightful dream, yet the vessel in which I was, the wind that blew me from the detested shore of Ireland and the sea which surrounded me told me, too forcibly, that I was deceived by no vision, and that Clerval, my friend and dearest companion, had fallen a victim to me and the monster of my creation. I repassed in my memory my whole life, my quiet happiness while residing with my family in Geneva, the death of my mother and my departure for Ingolstadt. I remembered shuddering, the mad enthusiasm that hurried me on the creation of my hideous enemy, and I called to mind the night in which he first lived. I was unable to pursue the train of thought. A thousand feelings pressed upon me, and I wept bitterly. Ever since from my recovery from my fever, I had been in the custom of taking every night a small quantity of laudanum, for it was by means of this drug only that I was enabled to gain the rest necessary for the preservation of life.
Oppressed by the recollection of my various misfortunes, I now swallowed double my usual quantity, and soon slept profoundly. But sleep did not afford me respite from thought and misery. My dreams presented a thousand objects that scared me. Towards morning I was possessed by a kind of nightmare. I felt the friend's grasp in my neck, and I could not free myself from it. Groans and cries rung in my ears. My father, who was watching over me, perceiving my restlessness, awoke me. The dashing waves were round. The cloudy sky above. The fiend was not here. A sense of security. A feeling that a truce was established between the present hour and the irresistible, disastrous future, imparted to me a kind of calm forgetfulness of which the human mind is by its structure peculiarly susceptible. <laughs>